Kick those tires and start that virtually fake fire. It's time to camp. Many of you do not know what an NDE is. Some of you do know. It stands for a near-death experience. And for regular listeners of my show, you've probably experienced one yourself. When I go droning on and on, that's probably the closest you'll ever get to it. But here is someone who actually knows what they're talking about with NDEs. We have the director and writer of the new soon-to-be smash hit film, After Death, and I am so excited to welcome him into our virtual studio here today to tell us just a little bit more about this fascinating phenomena and to once and for all solve the mystery of what happens after you die. If he doesn't answer this for us, I will consider this episode a grave disappointment. So please welcome to our program, Mr. Stephen Gray. Stephen, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me here, Ryan. Okay, so rather than make everyone wait, all right, because we know what's going to happen. So when you die... What happens? Yeah, so I mean, well, in our film, we interviewed 14 different people who clinically died uh, anywhere between, uh, you know, seconds to an hour and 45 minutes uh, is the longest that we have in the film. Now, there's counts that are longer than that, but that's kind of what we landed on. And these people all talk about uh, basically at at the point of death, uh, they left their body and many of them see their body from outside of themselves at first. Some sometimes they're confused depending on you know how how it happened, uh, but then they see themselves and then they basically either see angels or dead relatives or they meet Christ face to face, and and they're brought and ushered upwards towards a heavenly realm. Hmm. Now, now I was half teasing you because I know we can't for sure state what exactly happens after we die, but this is very interesting. Um, so. This ND phenomena has been reported uh, for uh, actually thousands of years, right? We have actual accounts from that go way, way back. The idea of people encountering something on the other side is actually historically quite established, right? There's some. Uh, can you give us any examples? Because uh, I, I believe this has occurred for a long period of human history. Yeah, we, we kind of go into some of that in the film, that this isn't necessarily something that's new, Um you know, we, we talk about an, an account, um, an ancient account of a Roman soldier who who died uh, and and came to on his funeral pyre. And um, and, you know, it talks about basically seeing, you know, this other world, this unseen realm. Uh, later, we, we also kind of talk about in the Bible, you know, Paul may have had a near death experience. You know, he, he was stoned to death in Lystra and he was left for dead. So the assumption is that he was that he was dead. And then later he got back up and went into the city. Now later he he talks about in uh, in Second Corinthians about how he was caught up into the third heaven, and you know he was seeing things that are you know unpermitted to to talk about, and uh, and he's he he talks about actually I think it's two or three times he describes how he doesn't know whether he was in his body or out. He's not sure, and only God knows. Um, so yeah, I think this this phenomenon has been going around for. A long time, but I think we're hearing about near death experiences more commonly because, you know, in the, I think it was the late '60s. We, uh, you know, we started to doing doing CPR methods of resusc- resuscitation to bring people back from the dead. Right. So basically, the brink of d- brink of death, uh, cardiac arrest. We're now using methods clinically to to intervene and 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 bring people back sort of from the from that brink. And I think because of that, and it could be because of that also it could be you know because of you know, some supernatural intervention, more and more people are coming forward and talking about having had a near death experience. Hmm. Now, would you classify the data on NDEs? And obviously, the caveat being we're studying something that inherently, if you die, we don't really, you know, we can't prove this. And so what we're actually looking at is anecdotal observations from someone who's been resuscitated. But there are observations that these individuals can make. And one could attempt to say that there's no other way they could have reported some of the observations that these deceased people have. How rigorous is the data on this? And if you were to ask some of the leading experts or even just scientists who would look at this data, and understandably, since it is a, you know, it's, a, it's an abstract subject, um, how would you rate the data? And are there some things that are just completely that go beyond coincidence? Yeah, there's there's definitely accounts that stand out um, and challenge kind of the you know the maybe the mainstream kind of idea that in in the in terms of the medical field in terms of doctors and stuff that uh, 
a lot of neurosurgeons still kind of hold to the idea that uh, we are just our brain, right? Our consciousness is just caught up. Our mind is is developed by a, a physical organ that resides in our head, the brain, and it's producing consciousness. And so there's a lot of accounts. Um, we've included a lot of them in, in the film as well that are, um, yeah, they, they challenge that uh, idea uh, because... So in our film, we have Dr. Jeffrey Long. He's amassed 4,000 uh, verified accounts of near-death experiences. Um, so uh, in, basically, he has, he has a survey that's uh, used, used the same kind of survey method as, as any other you know, study out there, medical study out there. And he goes through, uh, it's, it's a very long, uh, laborious kind of questionnaire. And he's also tested this on people who've not had near-death experiences. And basically, the result is, you know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. There's no alignment in any of the data. Uh, but all of the people who have had these near-death experiences uh, upon clinical death, um, the, the, you, there's a lot of overlap in, in, the, in the data that they're describing. But like you were saying, when people talk about, you know, they see an angel or a, or a dead relative or have these conversations with, you know, entities that are, you know, in the spirit realm, and then they talk about things that are, you know, amazing and, and all that kind of stuff in terms of like heaven or, or, or hell, um, those things are, they're subjective. They're totally subjective. I mean, we can't, we can't go there to, to verify any of that stuff. But, um, the, the interesting thing about near-death experiences are there's a lot of cases that will, what we would call is vertical. So they have a vertical near-death experience. So, um, part of that is having, uh, an, basically an orthoscopic part of their experience where they leave their body and they're, they're seeing, um, the scene where their body is from outside of themselves. So typically it's it's above, but it's not always. So Pam Reynolds in our film, her case is interesting where she she's seeing herself at uh, an operating table uh, and the vantage point is kind of from over the shoulder of the surgeon who's performing the surgery. So she recognizes herself on on the hospital bed at, or on the, on the uh, operating table rather in the, in the theater and they're performing brain surgery. So her case is, I think, to me, one of the most fascinating ones because I, I think you talk about it in the film, it's kind of like a laboratory test. This probably has like the richest amount of data that can be verified. And honestly, it, it just has, you know, surgeons perplexed. They don't know how um, someone could relay the information in any other way other than to have actually physically left her body. So uh, during the procedure, uh, she has all of the blood removed from her brain. She's on purpose, you know, killed because uh, during the surgery, they, they have to stop her heart so that the, the, the blood's not pumping through her body. And they drain all the blood out of her head. So her, her, her brain is not able to create new memory or function in any, any way. And she also has um, an EEG monitor that's hooked up that's uh, checking her brain waves during the entire procedure. So, and it has to be flatlined for them to, to proceed. So basically she had a brain aneurysm which is in the lower part of the brain stem, which, you know, in our film, uh, the, one of the neurosurgeons, Dr. Carl Green, talks about it's, it's kind of a neurosurgeon's no man's land. And this surgery happened in, in the 90s. And at that time, it was very experimental. There was only a few done. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to say whether it was going to be successful or not. Um, but turned out this one was successful. Um, it's called an operation. It's, it's called a, a standstill procedure. She's clinically dead for an hour and her brain is not able to, again, function or, or create, you know, any pathways or new memories or anything like that. That's when she has this near death experience. That's when she steps outside of her body. She sees the operation take place and then she's able to recall and relay that later in the next day when she's recovering in the, in the, uh, in the ICU. She's, she's, she's talking to the neurosurgeon and asking questions about things that happened that went wrong. So one of the things that happened in surgery was um, they had to switch um, from one leg to the other in terms of getting blood flow to re-enter her body because uh, the vein was cannulated. And so they had to switch the other leg and they were stressed out and, and, and kind of yelling at each other in the operating theater. Um, and she also talks about, you know, the, the, where the tools were on, uh, on the bone saw and what that looked like. And to her, it, it reminded her of her, her dad's socket wrench set. Um, she, you know, she's never seen any of this before. She's wondering what this is and how, and okay, well, they're, now they're opening up her, her brain. She also talks about how she felt it was very insensitive that in the operating theater, they're playing this song, Hotel California. Uh, she's like, I want to be stuck here forever. 
And she, so she's, she's talking about all these different things that, you know, actually did happen and later could be verified. Obviously these surgeons were there, they were present and they, they don't know how on earth she was able to retain that information when her brain was offline. So I think there's cases like that. There's also cases where, you know, people sometimes will, uh, they'll be outside of a room where their body even was. So they may be in a room that's two or three down from where the surgery was happening or where the accident scene happened. Sometimes they even go back to, you know, say their home and they're hearing about conversations, private conversations between people that can later be verified in terms of even the time. This is the moment when, when, their, when their body was, was declared dead. So those kind of cases are, you know, that's it's like we can verify that the, the stuff happened here in the material world. And it's really hard to, to, to think about, you know, how if we are just our brain, how, how that brain could produce that, you know, especially when it's completely offline. For sure. So in the Pam Reynolds case, and obviously that's a more notable case, uh, I think, among these NDEs. Right. And so uh, to play uh, devil's advocate here. So how would you respond to sort of the the skeptics who might say, OK, one um, in her specific case. Right. She was awakened and she still had the tube in her. Right. So she could infer potentially. Um, what happened. And then, yeah, I think the skeptics also would say that, uh, you know, y under general anesthesia, you could still have some perceived awareness. And I often, and I wonder too, you know, because obviously we know that there are nerve receptors and cells that can absorb information beyond just our brain. So uh, is it a plausible explanation that your body, even if your brain is sort of, you know, not functioning, that you could still perceive things and data could be stored neurologically in the brain and perceived. And then upon her awakening, she assembles that together. Uh, and for some awareness, um, is that, uh, is that a, at all a plausible explanation? And if not, why would you say you would attribute this more to paranormal causes? Well, for, first of all, I, I just want to specify, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, obviously. Neither so, one of us are, but that's know, not going to stop us from, yeah, yeah. from hot takes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. But, um, but the, the cool thing was, again, we, we had the privilege of talking to the, the, the main surgeon who performed the surgery, as well as Dr. Carl Green, who was present during the entire operation. Right. And so, um, you know, we also have, you know, medical transcripts that, that, that kind of, de that depict, okay, we did have a, a flat line for Pam Reynolds during, during the surgery. If we, so one thing to just, just to confirm is if we didn't have a flat line during Pam Reynolds surgery, like, let's just say, for example, that maybe there were some brain spikes during the surgery and that we're not, you know, that we're just not talking about maybe the nurses, there's a, there's a, for whatever reason, they all wanted to go in on this and, and, you know, make this a splash and, and uh, create some controversy and, and this never happened. The, uh, the flat line, uh, basically on the EEG monitor, if it wasn't flatline, one, it would be very dangerous for them to proceed with surgery. Two, it would be actually be medical malpractice. Like these doctors wouldn't be operating anymore if that, if that was So they have an interest in making sure she's clinically dead for this thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Both medically in terms of, you know, what they're actually supposed to be doing and also, you know, legally speaking. Yes. This happens in the United States. They don't want to get sued. Um, mm. And so, so there's that element. There's also the fact that uh, so the, the actual uh, measurement for her EEG monitor was basically, you know, kind of like my AirPods in, in my in my ears. She had these two um, these two uh, devices that were put in put in her ears and, and taped closed. And these devices, what they're doing is they're sending a pulse from one uh, from one basically like a, whatever meter to the other side. Um, and I think it's like a hundred. I can't remember what exact number it was one hundred twenty or something decibels or whatever. Basically, it, it, they they described to me it's it's the same as like having your ear next to a, a jackhammer that's ripping a, a ripping concrete out of the ground. Sorry, my camera shut up here. Um, well, you flat yeah, you flatlined. It, okay. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> You're bad. What did you see when you left Riverside for a minute? <laughs> for not list for appeal listening. Stephen cut his feed cut out, so we can only assume he went to another dimension and is now Obviously, back with us. The only, only explanation. <laughs> Um, so basically, uh, yeah, the, this monitor is sending a signal between, from one ear to the other. The decibel count is like, is extreme. It would, it would cause permanent, uh, ear damage, uh, if, if her brain wave, if her brain was functioning, of course it, it wasn't. Um, and the way that they, again, they know is the, is the flat line, but if her brain was like, for whatever reason, you know, turned on for a moment, again, it would be permanent, uh, damage to her, to her hearing. She had no hearing loss. She's actually a musician, so mm, that was important that would to preserve. Be, uh, yeah, it would be very important, and obviously she, you know, she continued after, so it would be problematic for her on multiple levels. 
Um, so, so there's that. I mean, we've certainly heard of cases. Uh, I mean, even my neighbor here, he he went underwent an operation, and he did have uh, anesthesia awareness. You know, some people, yeah. uh, they, they don't they don't administer. Every human's different. You know, so we, as doctors, anesthesiologists, they're supposed to administer a specific amount, and you're supposed to kind of know the reaction of the body. But not everyone can predict that, and some people, unfortunately. They're actually awake, which is terrifying to me. I would never want to experience that. That happened to me during uh, my wisdom teeth being pulled. I woke up a few minutes early and I could feel, and again, I don't blame anyone because you can't, uh, you know, you time it as best you can, yeah, but sure. I awoke and I could, I couldn't move and I was trapped and I could, I could feel the pressure yeah. and then the pain, the, uh, the pain perception was coming back. Uh, and it was terrifying. I mean, it was like for a kid, especially you like, it's, it was, it was awful. Um, and it's, totally. yeah, so I can only imagine what that would be like on a, on a bigger, I mean, having your yeah, wisdom exactly. teeth sucks pulled in general, you know? So. <laughs> yeah. Any kind of, yeah. Going under the knife, not, not fun. Um, but yeah, for Pam's case, like I said, it was, it was like the most imperative thing because it's such a sensitive area. They're, they're, um, they're doing the operation on the lower part of the brain stem. So, you know, like above all cases of, of anesthesia, this is one where they have to be extremely precise. So, Generally, actually, I'm curious. So since you got a chance to interview the people there, right? So there's commentators who weren't there who could say, ah, I don't think this is uh, something that's going right. to be uh, considered paranormal. But uh, what's the consent from the medical uh, professionals that were actually there? Do they have a consensus right now uh, from everyone who operated on her? Is there sort of a over like overarching? We agree. We believe this was a genuine near death experience. Uh, the, so the consensus is there's no other explanation. Okay. But I would say, so Dr. Spetzer, I don't think he necessarily thinks, uh, you know, that we are a spirit and all that kind of stuff. Dr. Carl Green kind of came to the conclusion, no, that absolutely was a, a spiritual experience. It's just kind of like, what, what I find is uh, when doctors don't have an explanation for this, and it challenges their, their notion, typically they'll just say, I don't know, I don't want to talk about it. They, they typically just don't want to talk about it because there's not really, yeah. you know, so we move on. Because there's not really anything to, to say about it. So is the current, and again, obviously, I, I, I know we can't speak for every skeptic, but for, so one, uh, the the overarching, there's an abundance of evidence and literature that even skeptics say, okay, we know this phenomena is happening and there's enough. We may not know exactly what is causing it, but we do know that it's been reported widely enough. And so can we say that there is legitimately a good amount of data to support this phenomena and even uh, skeptics will have to acknowledge okay this is something that is happening definitely okay. i mean yeah for sure there's the counts are happening uh, all around the world um like i said dr dr uh, jeffrey long has amassed four thousand verified accounts that's that's a you know a profound amount of data but there's you know there's there's reports from hospitals really all around the world that you know outside of even just his study i think this is it's definitely something that's grabbing uh, at the attention of doctors, um, even to the point where, I mean, we have to even figure out, medically speaking, you know, what is the point of death? And are we redefining that now? And, and that that is kind of a conversation that's just starting up now for doctors, because we always kind of thought that um, basically when the heart stops, and we assume that there's not going to be brain activity shortly thereafter, and then, you know, a period past that, there's going to be permanent brain damage. Now, that does happen for, for most people. That is that is the case in the majority. I think it's beyond 10 minutes or something like that without uh, intervention, you know, permanent brain damage would settle in. But uh, we're starting to have to redefine, you know, death because of uh, near-death experiences and what is that kind of threshold or point of death. The other interesting thing I find, uh, medically speaking, is when we're doing uh, resusc resuscitation efforts, uh, even in like the most controlled environment, Dr. Uh, Mary Neal, who is in our film, she'll, she'll talk about this um, often, where basically you can have two uh, of the exact same situation in a very controlled environment, let's say in, in, a, in a hospital, in an operating room or, or, or in, or in an uh, ER or something like that. And there's medical inter intervention to perform CPR resuscitation efforts. Um, you could have two different people, the exact same situation performed uh, at the same time, and you'll have two very different outcomes. You know, doctors, as much as we talk about, oh yeah, it's this plus this will equal this, and we will we can we can intervene, and this will happen. I mean, the reality in hospitals, if you've ever you know been, uh, you know, and, and seen that, it's just it's not it's not so cut and dry, and it's we don't have the control over it the way we think we do, and so yeah, you know, yeah. Um. So, 
right now, so, uh, and again, adding on to the, the skeptics too. So uh, as far as the argument that it's a secretion, a mass secretion of distress chemicals and some sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, mania that it, it, you know, overtakes the mind, et cetera. What's the response to uh, that? And would you say that is sort of many of the skeptics would argue that it's just a mass release of sort of neurochemicals? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So there, there's a few interesting things uh, I well, at least I found interesting um, to kind of, uh, I guess, like counter that argument would be. Um, so there, there's a lot of cases where if somebody's brought into an emergency room uh, or sorry, an emergency, you know, in, in an ambulance and they were uh, they were unconscious at the point when they were discovered, their body was discovered. And we don't know how that happened. Um, typically, like paramedics will uh, assume that this could be a, a drug overdose, and we don't know always for sure. And so, just to quickly intervene, they give they give them basically like an anti narcotic. So what what it's doing is this chemical creates no problems for anyone who you know didn't have uh, w you know drugs in their system. It does nothing to the brain except for what it does is it blocks uh, it blocks in the brain's ability to create any kind of uh, you know euphoric senses or anything like that there's no no endorphins are able to be produced uh, but what is what it's supposed to do is you know if if you were uh, unconscious due to uh you know having some kind of drugs in your system it'll it'll kill that effect and intervene and, and we can save lives that way but the interesting thing is people who report having had near-death experiences uh some of them will have had this uh this you know thing blocked in their system so the brain is not able to produce any of any of these kind of uh, reactions chemicals in in the brain to create like say a euphoric feeling or anything like that it's just completely killed and yet they're talking about having near the experience the same as people either who did have drugs in their system who didn't have any any drugs in their system uh whether it happened in a hospital or, or outside of a hospital it's it kind of is a the experience happens regardless of all of these different kind of situations which which i i found interesting the other thing too is that People who typically have an ear to the experience, they'll, they'll talk about, you know, the experience is so profound and so specific uh, that it changes the course of their entire life. It's not just a random, you know, generation of, you know, colors. And I felt better, you know, all of a sudden for a moment. It wasn't a momentary thing. It was like I was entering a, a different dimension and I was seeing something or someone specific and I was having this conversation and it was about this and, and, and including having a full life review. The other thing I find interesting with near the experiences is the, the life review is a very common thing. And you could say that, you know, maybe the brain is producing that if it was your just your own life. But some of these people like Mary is one of them where she was shown uh, her life uh, basically is in its entirety in sort of like a three dimensional uh, experience. So she goes and she she's really reliving, reliving that. But she's also seeing the effects that, of the choices that she made in her life and how that interacted with the people around her and then she's seeing the backstory of the people around her including uh unfortunately there was a, there's an a, abuse in her story and she's seeing uh the, basically the whole life of the person the abuser and and kind of what brought them to that moment howard is the same where he was shown his father and from the moment of his father's birth all the way up to the point where his his father had become abusive in the home and um seeing that perspective of other people's lives, I think is like, I mean, how is, and if, if any of that could be later verified in terms of, you know, going and talking to these people, which Mary did, which Howard did, you know, it's, it makes them very uncomfortable. Uh, but it, it's like, how on earth are you, are you seeing that, um, that perspective, yeah. you know? So one thing also that I, I found interesting about NDEs, and I'd love you to talk a little bit about this, and I know you get into this in the film a little bit, is that one would expect, okay, sure, a lot of Christians have NDEs and they see God, but we actually find in many of these NDEs, it happens despite religious preference, it happens cross-culturally, and there seems to be a fairly consistent pattern, which could point towards a innate human uh, de you know, uh, you know, device that's causing that. But can you speak a little bit to the fact that uh, these NDEs transcend uh, religious persuasion? Yeah. We, so again, 14 different people who uh, clinically died and had these experiences, uh, a variety of these people that we talked to came from very different backgrounds, cultures, religions. So we were able to uh, talk to three different people who uh, had these near experiences in India. One was an atheist, two were Hindu. Uh, we, we talked to a, a lady out in Israel who 
Uh, I, I believe that at the time that when she had died, she was she was actually an atheist. Although you know, in in her family line, you know, they they had a, a rich Jewish tradition um, and and belief systems. Although yeah, again, out there, very different um, belief in terms of what the afterlife is going to look like and what it's what it's going to be then, then here. As much as we might think that the it, you know is Israel is very similar to the Western culture. It's very different in terms of the teaching of what happens after. And so, and then we also have Steve Kang, who, uh, when he was when he grew up, it was in uh, South Korea, and at the time where he was growing up in South Korea, um, they they didn't have televisions in homes. They didn't have movie theaters uh, in, in their cities. There was no Western culture cultural influence because it would be uh, thought as like an invasion. So there's no street preachers. There's no access to Bibles. Um, they grew up Buddhist by default. Uh, and so their family, you know, and, and they weren't just, um, you know, surface level Buddhists. They were very, very serious uh, Buddhists. And so, he, you know, he would often go to the temples and learn from monks at, at the temples. And, and their portrayal of what happens after, after you die is something so specific. And all of these people are talking about having an experience that is very counter to what they were raised to believe. And in the same way, the same thing for people that had an early experience in North America. I mean, even some people who, you know, were Christian before they died, uh, you know, what they see and describe is, is uh, always, you know, way more than what they were raised to believe. Like it's going to be this specific thing and it's only going to be that. And then it's something that's, you know, profoundly, yeah. uh, I say more than that. And so, but the, the, there's commonalities that just perfectly overlap, which I found very interesting because it's like, yeah, it's either that we're all just human and, and there's this sort of universal thing that our brain produces when we die <laughs> could be the case, I guess, or it's, you know, universally, this is a spiritual dimension that people are all seeing. And it's one thing, you know, it's, it's, it's heaven, it's, it's hell, it's whatever, whatever it is, it's, it's not, it's not um, different for all of these different people. The overlap is just, you know, perplexing. Is there any data uh, as far, and uh, forgive me, I forgot if this was covered, but um, is there any more, any information as far as the NDEs that are experienced by adults uh, based uh, or children? Um, and do the majority of NDEs happen in one group or another? It's the same. Yeah, okay. for both. But typically, so uh, I'll say that, and in people from different cultures, religions, or, um, uh, and different languages, uh, as well as, you know, adults and children, what they may come back and, and use slightly different terminology. Right. But it's like, you have to think about the intention of like, what, what, what is it they're describing? A kid may not say that, okay, this man who is, who is uh, a man of light came before me, uh, and is, is equivalent to a thousand burning suns may not use that same, you know, descriptors because, you know, they're a kid and, and their, their sort of, uh, descriptions might be a little more childlike. Right. Uh, but typically, the, what they're talking about is very similar to between adults and kids, and and again, like you know, they're they're sometimes meeting family relatives that they didn't even know were dead or didn't even know were in their family line at all, and they're seeing them not, um, not as basically as they were remembered on earth. If there was photos of them, you know, and say they were seventy, eighty years old, that's not how they look in heaven. They they what everyone describes is the people that passed on that they that they meet are ageless. They don't say, hmm. oh, yeah, I was exactly, you know, 18 years old or whatever. It's like they were ageless. But Don Piper, who wrote the book uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven in our film, he talks about meeting his grandfather. And he would if he had to guess, he would say probably 30 years old, but he would say in his prime. And uh, but again, just making it very clear, it's ageless. So it's age is not a, a consideration, but they look different and yet you know, very obviously identifiable. This is who that person is. Mm. Now, as you share in the film too, not all NDEs, despite the common description of a experience with profound love, acceptance, light, you know, friendly people waving at you, sort of like a, you know, international arrivals terminal uh, at LAX, that uh, some people uh, have a different experience and perhaps a, a darker reality. Uh, could you talk about some of the experiences that are negative and some of the accounts of people experiencing what they perceive to be hell, uh, or maybe even a form of purgatory. Yeah. Um, so three people in the film have had hellish near to the experiences, uh, which has also been studied, uh, like near to the experiences in general in, in their studies, 
there, there's sort of category of what they call distressing near-death experiences. Typically, in the studies, we don't want to label that things as either heaven or hell because it has you know religious implications. So they'll use a term like distressing near-death experiences, but I mean it's really describing the same thing. Um, you know, our, in our film, John Burke, who wrote the book Imagine Heaven, he talks about there's a report that uh, that talks about um, I think it's something like 23% of uh, near -death, reported near-death experiences are distressing or hellish, and I think that report is probably very um, underreported because there's a sort of this reality of when people have these distressing hellish near-death experiences. Um, there's kind of no reason to come forward and talk about it. Like, what would be the reason to share that, right? So yeah, people can ask you what sin you committed that you're headed, exactly. that you're headed straight there. You know, I saw. Yeah, there's. Yeah, a you remember the movie Ghost? The dark shadows come and get you and take you away, versus the like just spotlight you walk into and you know Patrick Swayze gets yeah. to walk into the light. Fortunately, <laughs> but uh, that was a that movie as a kid was like yikes. I would definitely not want to go the other side. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's 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 a lot of shame that's kind of like mm -hmm. you know wrapped up in that. So there's not a lot of people that want to come forward. I want to say that a lot of people who even have these heavenly encounters, they're typically don't want to come forward because there's a lot of you know ridicule and a lot of skepticism around you know their accounts. They know that this you know, experience was real, and to them, they talk about it that it's more real than here than this conscious experience here. It's more con there's more conscious experience there than there is here. It's a different level of kind of a consciousness. Uh, than it is here. And so in the same people, uh, the same way that people describe hellish new experiences. Um, so some of the commonalities that we would hear in these kind of distressing experiences would be that they're going to a place that's darker than dark. So it, it's the inverse of light. They say that it's not like being in a room with the lights turned off, um, you know, you're, you're, you're closed in into a box because, um, you know, that we know, we can understand and try to, you know, I get a sense of what that might feel like, but this is completely different. It said it's darker than dark, so it, it, it's a it's a darkness that they can't it, perceive here on Earth, and so and they also talk about it's basically like it's a place of the opposite of uh, everything that is God, which is you know love and and light and life. It's death. It's it's hopelessness. It's all it's the inverse of light, mm. and there's also this awareness that. Um, I mean, Steve King talks about this. He had a hellish dream the experience, um, and then he later, later woke up in the in the uh, operating room where they were able to just barely kind of bring him back online. Um, and he was so thankful to to come to, but he had this hellish experience, and he just knew that despite all of these kind of um, ideas of what the afterlife might look like, even in his religion, it was taught that you know there is hell. Or sort of a version of hell but you can get yourself out of it and basically the afterlife is just an unending uh growth opportunity so you could it could be twenty thousand years it could be a hundred thousand years it could be a day and you may go to like these different layers of hell but you can actually work your way up through those layers and then eventually kind of get out of it and 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 go towards these kind of heavenly realms but in his religion heaven isn't a place where god lives heaven is is basically being in, in an empty void uh, where if you're reaching nirvana, it's essentially you are alone and there's ultimate peace in being alone for forever. Mm. That's kind of what your goal is to reach. And But his experience is like, oh my goodness, I'm in a place now that's like not at all what I was taught, you know? And he knew that it was eternal. He knew that he wasn't going get, to get himself out of it. As he describes it, you know, it's a different set of rules here. So it's like, you know, we can have all this different, you know, philosophical ideas of what the afterlife is and, and you know, how, how that can work. And maybe we can, you know, level up and do these different things. But he just knew that he was like, now he's entering a place that he has no control over what happens here. Yeah. He's going, he's going here. Yeah. So now you hear his account. Now, the skeptic to his account would say that he was in a very distressed state um and was kind of not in a great headspace and um sure and so you know is there any uh as far as the negative ndes is there any data on people's uh headspace before they uh, enter into a negative nd or is there actually no relation as obviously a lot of these just happen you know people have an accident or something unexpected yeah. but uh what i find interesting like you open with an account of these pilots and you go well compared you know uh with the was justin is his name um or Dale Black, the guy who no, so the uh, the you have the um the pilots, but then the gentleman, uh, the Buddhist, yeah, Steve King. Yeah, so Steve, 
Now, you, it's funny. You could argue Steve was not in a great headspace. Obviously, he had an account yeah. where he felt a spiritual entity told him to take his life. Uh, right. But you know, I have to imagine that the pilots, prior to when everything's going wrong, they're also not in the happiest headspace. Uh, so, you know, one could, you know, is there any sort of connecting tissue as far as uh, the state of mind prior to the ND and the outcome of whether it's positive or negative? Uh, no. Okay. Um, so yeah, the three people who had hellish experiences two of them, you know, would, I would say were in distressful states. Uh, one of them was also, uh, Paul Oeda who had this, uh, distressing near the experiences or experience. He, he was actually, uh, at the time basically on cocaine. Uh, he was, I think on a drug trip for, for about a week straight, he hadn't slept. And so he's, you know, his brain's probably going into psychosis, but kind of similarly, it's like, he just didn't want to live. He wanted it to be over so that what he wasn't thinking he's going to go into the other world it's just like he just wants peace which would be that he ends and that he wouldn't continue howard storm though didn't have a drug trip he just dies in a hospital you know and he was he was an atheist uh didn't believe there was anything after but later he has uh, a distressing near the experience um but in, in, so in, in the way it happened it was very different you know it's like it's it, it doesn't really correlate to the way they died mary who drowned you know and she's without oxygen for 30 minutes and she's she's pinned under a waterfall i mean it's got to be pretty distressing i would say the way she died i it's honestly like <laughs> drowning is one of my worst oh, drowning yeah. falling or the, uh, there's all these different ways burning it's like i don't want any of that stuff right like no please no <laughs> but she she's drowning um underwater and and i was i was gonna say uh with her case in particular just really quickly there's this interesting point where i i've read a bunch of articles on people that try and discount Mary's experience that, okay, well, she, if she was out ox without oxygen, she was underwater for 30 minutes. Well, it was probably cool water. And there's definitely cases of people who've, you know, been, who've dr drowned in frozen lakes and have, have been able to be recovered even like an Oh, they say after. she was like cryo frozen, like Ripley and alien. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> well, not to that level, but like, but, it, but it, there are cases Preserves, like legitimately okay. where, yeah, where it, cause it, what it does is it cools down the brain. So, that you, so which would be helpful for that. It, it slows down the process of yeah. permanent brain damage yeah. essentially. So, um, but in Mary's case, actually the water temperature was roughly 63.9 degrees Fahrenheit. So she, she was, she was kayaking in Southern Chile, which was at that time, uh, their summer. So it was super warm temperatures. The war it was warm water. And so it was, you know, it wasn't freezing temperatures where, where she drowned, but you know, definitely a scary, I would say for me, a very, I would just be so terrified that if she's underwater and she, she knows she can't get out of this, the waterfall, the pressure is keeping her in the kayak and she, there's nothing she can do to free herself. But she, she talks about how in that moment, she didn't cry out like, you know, God help me, like, or whatever, like something to get her out of there. She just actually just kind of intentionally said, like, God, whatever happens here, you know, your, your will be done. Like, I'm just going to surrender. Hmm. I, I, I can, nothing I can do. And at that point, it's like, she felt this overwhelming peace kind of come over her. And then she actually felt the presence of Christ come to her underwater and then lift her up out of that experience. So a terrifying experience turning into a very peaceful and blissful, you know, experience. It's yeah. It doesn't, doesn't seem to be correlation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so viewers can know, and again, you can share or not share this, but uh, every, obviously every filmmaker brings something to the process, you know, to the art. I'd love to know, you know, what was the genesis of this film? Uh, did you come with a uh, pre-established perspective on this and a worldview that, you know, would influence this? But talk to us a little bit about the origins of the film and what you wanted to share with the world by making it. Yeah, so I've been a filmmaker for about 15 years now. Um, but what kind of got me into, you know, these, this topic of near-death experiences was it was born out of loss. Um, so back in 2012, my brother-in-law, he was killed by a drunk driver. Um, it was very close to him. And, you know, to, to see him here one moment and gone the next was really tough. Um, very painful. Uh, it was the lowest point of my life at that time. And um, so I... I grew up in a, in a Christian home. I went to church uh, all my life. And, uh, you know, I didn't really think about having a, sh a shallow faith, but I came to realize that, yeah, my faith is very shallow because in that time, I just kind of gave up on the idea of God or heaven. I just couldn't believe, 
you know, seeing the chaos that happened, how, how, how on earth could there be a God with, uh, and this is the answer that killing, you know, my, my mother-in-law's only son, um, you know, and, and, and just seeing that, yeah, that it just, it just wrecked us, it wrecked me. So I kind of let go of the idea of there being God for, for a period of time. Um, and it, that's kind of when people were starting to come, come to us. And my family didn't go through that, uh, that same kind of like shaking of the faith. They were just unwavering, which actually kind of made me a little more mad. <laughs> just like, why am I the one that's, you know, losing? And I, mm. I, I didn't, I didn't think highly of, of their faith at the, that time. Um, but people were recommending these books of people who, who had died and had these experiences. And, you know, at first, honestly, I was just like, ah, eh, it's just whatever. It's just stories. It doesn't mean anything to me. It wasn't until I heard an account of, um, there's Dr. Richard E.B. I heard an audio interview. I think it was on a CD all the way back then. And it was like him talking on this, um, in, in an audio form in an interview, what happened at the point of death. You know, he had fallen from like a two-story building and cracked his head open, uh, totally bled out uh, before anyone mm. uh, later found him. And then he was just brought to the morgue. He wasn't, he wasn't um, brought uh, to an ambulance and tried to intervene because it was already too late at that point. So he was thrown in a body bag, brought into a morgue, and woke up as they were trying to put him into the into the freezer. Um, but what he, what he talked about in terms of his experience was just you know incredible. It was so descriptive of that point of death and then seeing his body. I just never heard anything like that before, and I was like, what on earth is a doctor doing talking about this? You know. Uh, people are just going to, I think he's crazy already, uh, but there's just something so sincere in the way he's talking about it. So either he's the greatest con artist in the world, or maybe there's something to it. And so that's what made me kind of look into it a little bit further, a little bit further. Then after about 30 books, I was like, yeah, I got enough stories here, but there's got to be some evidence to, to back this up, you know? So Dale Black, who died in a plane crash in 1969 in Burbank, California, um, you know, if he says he died in a plane crash, sure enough, there's got to be evidence to surround that. It's for sure going to be an NTSB investigation. There's probably going to be some kind of, you know, it's happened in a place where there's a lot of cameras. So there's got to be some something to back that up. And sure enough, after kind of digging in, yep, there's an NTSB investigation. And yes, there's the report is that there's three pilots that were there, two, you know, died and one is in the ICU. That's kind of at the point when the when it, when it was wrapped. And, uh, and I think it was uh, something along those 16 minutes uh, before there was any signs of vitals for anyone. One pilot was decapitated. Um, the, other, uh, the other pilot, uh, there's two other pilots that basically had no, no movement. Dale was the first to kind of show some vitals. And then later Chuck as well as another pilot. And they were thrown together in the same ambulance and, and brought to this famous uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, hospital in Burbank, California. It was actually Evil Knievel's doctor who put Dale back together. <laughs> he just happened to not be on tour at that time. Uh, happened to be at the, at the you know hospital at that right time. Chuck and Dale were put into two different you know operating theaters, and and uh, and Dale was uh, they were able to kind of keep him stabilized. And unfortunately, they lost Chuck. And um, yeah, it's just like okay, for me it was like okay, I I I, I think I can get behind that he died, right? And now he's talking about, you know, seeing and describing things that, well, I mean, it probably lines up with a lot of things that happen. And as I started to uncover and pack more and more, I was like, actually, there's a lot of evidence, like we talked about earlier, about the out-of-body experiences and things that can be later verified, which, yeah, it had a profound impact on me. I think, you know, years into that, just kind of, it brought me back to my faith. It, it, it kind of secured my faith that I was like, I think I can, I can get behind this idea that there is God and there is heaven. I mean, I... Yeah. So, and then I started reading the, the Bible, um, you know, I think differently and, and more than I ever had before. Sorry, I'm having a quick ND again. <laughs> um, camera just shut off for a sec. Uh, yeah. And so it deepened my faith. It, it brought my, it restored my faith, but then it deepened my faith on a, on a different level uh, than it ever had before. And uh, that's been kind of my personal journey through this. But you know, we created this film uh, for skeptics uh, as well as believers alike because, you know, I, because I was asking those questions and not everyone in the film, you know, was, was, you know, on board with the idea that this was actually happening and this is true and all that. So hmm. 
we we entered this film with a lot of skepticism, you know, on purpose, and because we want to we want to bring people through that skepticism and um, and just kind of hold everything open handedly. You know, it's like let's let's kind of go on this journey together of discovery, and um, and we can we can begin to ask questions at the end. But you know, we're not telling anyone to believe anything specific. It's just kind of you know take these cases for what they are and and do with them whatever you know, whatever is going to happen in your life. But my, my hope with the film is that it kind of causes us to begin to ask those questions if we haven't thought about that before, like it did for me. And I think if we're, if we're reflecting on if there is something after, you know, if, if, if there is heaven, if there is hell, if, if, if all that is real, uh, and these cases, you know, certainly make a strong case for that, um, then, you know, what could that mean for our life here? You know, and, and what could we do with the time we have here? My, my brother-in-law was uh, 36 when he died. I'm 38 now. And, you know, it feels very strange to be two years older than my older, you know, my mm. brother-in-law who was kind of, I looked up to him in every way. And now it just feels very strange to be in this place. But I just know that, unfortunately, life can be short and it certainly is fragile. And we just, we don't know how much time. And I'm just, I'm just hoping that people kind of think differently about life and, and, and you know, the, choices that we make here and the impacts on, on lives that, that we, that we have. Oh, that's beautiful, man. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, uh, I think it's probably a good place to, to stop there. Um, well, uh, give us a little details. So the film is out October 27th. Yeah, it hits theaters October 27th. So the film is after death and, uh, people can get tickets at angel.com slash after death. But the cool thing with, with the film is because of with angel studios. So it, it's going to be releasing in, above 2000 theaters now i think we we're, we're north of that now we're, we're adding more theaters in the united states and canada regularly um should be playing for uh, about 10 days in the theater in the beginning but our, our hope is that um that people you know show up and 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 see this movie um being an independent filmmaker and because this film is independent you know showing up especially in that first weekend is is really vitally important to kind of show the box office and the industry that you know there is uh, an appetite for this, that there, there is a kind of a demand for this. It helps kind of secure that this film could be in theaters longer. And so our hope is that people kind of tr turn up and show up for the, for that first kind of weekend on October 27th, but also we want to make this film accessible to everyone. So we have a, a pay it forward program. If you, if people go to angel.com slash life after, uh, and if, if, you know, if this film is something, you know, they're excited about and they want others to see, they can actually buy a ticket for, for other people, real people are, using those uh to, to claim the tickets and in the same way if people aren't able to afford to go you know buy a ticket or just don't want to go buy a ticket um they can go to angel.com slash life after and claim a free ticket so we have the ability to do that for both uh canadians and americans to just make it accessible to watch this movie amazing well thank you so much um i pray no one has to have an nde but i do hope you enjoy learning about them you can go see after death We've been talking with Stephen Gray, and we appreciate you joining us, sir. Thanks so much for having me.